Yeah, it's not too bloody. Hello. Hello. Is that better? A bit closer. There.
Well, good morning, church, and welcome this morning. Let's begin with a word of prayer this week. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come into your house, that you are with us here this morning, and that we can rejoice in your presence. We thank you for all that you've done, and today we come and worship you. Amen. Let's begin this morning with our first worship song. Would you stand with me, please? Praise him. next sing- song this morning is Great Things. He has done great things.
streets. Lord, you have done great things. I think of what God is doing in our community at the moment. And, you know, it's really quite exciting because at the beginning we just started going to the Ty Alice School and we started doing Breakfast Club and getting involved in the school over there. And in these past couple of weeks, Cameron's been asked to speak at their um, opening of the new parents coming into the school over there next, next, uh, for next year. And at the end of this month, I think it is, he's actually going to be speaking to the parents about the Breakfast Club and what we're providing over there. And, you know, God is giving us such an opportunity in that school. I've got the opportunity to teach different classes and they're happy to take me whatever day I'm available. And while I'm not doing much work over there, I'm actually able to be involved with the staff and the students and, and we're becoming more and more involved and I have a lot of them coming and chatting with me and uh, about different issues that they're facing in their life. We've had the opportunity to help people in our community by helping them move and um, hopefully we might even see that lady come to church soon which is such a blessing and you know God gives us so many opportunities and through the week even through our children's ministry now we've we're starting to see lots of good things come out of that and I'm looking forward to meeting some of those families in our church service eventually and there is that possibility soon we've started our youth hub and Lizzie and Mikey have shared with their friends about that. Uh, unfortunately, won't be on this week, just so that you know, Cameron and I are heading up to Meribah quickly after the service. It's my mum's 80th birthday tomorrow. So we just want to spend that with her and my family. And a lot of my family have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, um, all my uncles now, <laughs> there's three of them. So um, it would be a great opportunity for me to minister to my own family this week. And so we're just heading up today after service and then coming back Tuesday. We'll just take a couple of days off at the beginning of this week, this week so that we can celebrate with my mum. You know, as I think about the words of that song, he has done great things. I'm sure that we can sit there and think of the things that God has done in our lives, you know. Um, we're here for a reason. We're here in this service for a reason. It's because we love God and he loves us and we're here to serve him. So let's continue to praise this morning and I'm going to invite our little singer Hannah up and she's going to help us with the next song. It's a kid's time so feel free to stand or sit whatever you like and we'll do that this morning. Thanks Mike. to go to Nineveh, but he went the other way. Jonah got on a boat and sailed into the sea. God sent a big storm while Jonah was sleeping. The sailors were scared and asked, why would this be? Then Jonah said, the storm is because of me. The sails threw Jonah over the side of the boat. The storm stopped at once and the ship was kept afloat. Jonah was swallowed by a great big fish. He was in his belly going swish, swish, wish the fish swam along for three days and nights jonah said he was sorry and that he would make it right Of Nineveh from a 
really bad fate But you wanna learn to obey God And what it was like to be fish bait As we've been learning about the story of Jonah and Pastor Cameron is going to continue speaking about that um, story in the Bible this week. I want to have a special slideshow of just some of the um, things that have had special moments in our families that have happened over the last couple of months and I want to introduce you to Penny's grandson and Jenny's great-grandson. And so there's some photos there of, of that beautiful little boy this morning. We want to introduce you to P Pam's grandson. Uh, Lincoln, is it? Lincoln. <laughs> Lincoln. And Pam had the opportunity to run up to Brizzy the other weekend with us and um, she got to spend the weekend with him. So we just wanted to share those photos with you this morning. And many of you have asked about my daughter's wedding. And so this is a photo of my daughter, Jessica, and her husband, Sean. So that was, I had the pleasure of um, marrying them this September just gone. So just wanted to share a few of those with you, some special moments, and I uh, want to continue that. So if there's something special that happens in your family that you would like to share with our church, we would love for that to be able to happen. And so we'll continue with the announcements or whatever's next. Yep, announcements. Next slide. Okay, Young at Heart happening this Friday, or Friday the 25th of November at 12 p.m. for lunch. That's at the Sawtell Bowling Club. Please, um, Jenny's away this weekend, but they'll be back soon. Just let me know or um, Connell. Connell would be the great one to contact because he's Jenny's helper. So um, just let, let Connell know and um, he'll let Jenny know and they can organise that for us. Ah, the underground. The underground won't be on this weekend, unfortunately, this, fr this Monday afternoon, just due to the fact that we will be away. But that will continue starting next, the following Monday. And that's an exciting time that we're going to have with young people in our area. Happy Feet's going again and it starts at 7am. Cameron and I have been faithfully turning up when it's not raining. Um, and I went walking with Bruce on my own the other day. <laughs> so that's back again and um, we look forward to continuing that group now. With all the rain, we haven't been having it as much. Crafty Fingers downstairs with um, Pam. Some great stuff happening there. Last week they helped me make 43 cards. Um, we now have 50 cards that will be going out this year to our school. So that is going to Tyala School and we'll be blessing the staff with each of those cards. Every staff member will receive one. And we'd also like to do a morning tea for them. So I'm wondering if next week, if you would mind bringing a plate of goodies or it doesn't matter what it is sandwiches cakes whatever actually probably not sandwiches because we've got to keep them for the day after but if you're enjoying baking goodies and stuff like that perhaps bake me something because we're going to take them over to the school on the monday and um, set up a morning tea for them and put their cards on the table so that they can receive a gift from our church personally and let's just pray for that now so that that is something that will impact them this christmas and a reminder of what God has already done and is going to do in their lives. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have that opportunity to minister to that school. We know that it's not an easy school and that the staff have had tough days and the children have tough days. But Father, I thank you that there are people that are willing to teach those children and just love them. And so Father, we as a church want to love on them and let them know that we are praying for them this Christmas for their families, for their children, and for the children in that school. So may this little morning tea that we provide and the cards that we send, let them know that there are people in the community that love them and that are praying for them this Christmas. So may it be a blessing to them. Amen. Our little fit prints, as cute as ever. We had a couple of new little kids this week just from the community, just reading our Facebook posts. 
So that's quite exciting because it means that people are looking on those sites for different things and constantly telling me that there is no playgroups and things like that are happening around the area. They actually even, I've even been asked if we could start one, uh, start a um, preschool here, but um, that's, that's just not a possibility for us at the moment. But the fact that we have something that they can invite their friends and family to is a real blessing. So that's Friday mornings at 9.30. If you have a heart for kids and would like to come and help me, that would be wonderful. Okay, thanks. And Bible study at Jenny's house this week at 6.30. Not at Jenny's house this week. It's not on this week, so that won't be on this week. But if you're wanting to know more about Bible study, come and see Pam today because she's the one in that group. Okay. Oh, Christmas Eve will be our Christmas service this, again this time. We would like to bring, invite you to come at 5 p.m., bring a plate of food to share, and we're going to have a meal together. So this will be the first year we've done that. If you have family plans and you need to, and you're going to be away this Christmas, that's okay. We are still going to meet and we are still going to have a time with those that perhaps don't have that opportunity to meet with their families. So that will be at 5pm and then we'll have a short service after that. So that will be our Christmas Eve service naturally Saturday the 24th of December. There will be no Sunday service due to the Christmas Eve service so that you will be free on Sunday to spend that with your families. Okay, morning tea straight after the service, that would be... Great to see you down there and we can fellowship together. I really love that, you know, when we first started here, there was only, we, we had to stop morning tea altogether. And it's really exciting to see everyone come down and fellowship today, at, um, each week at morning tea and some great conversations. In fact, sometimes I don't think you even want to leave. <laughs> so that's a beautiful thing. It's a great thing to see that our family as a church because we really are a church family and I see you as part of my family so it's a wonderful time to get to know you better. Let's continue with our offering this morning. We'll just quickly pray for that and then as we play the next song, please come and give. Heavenly Father, we thank you that there are ways that we can give back to you, that the money that we receive in our offering can work in our community. And Father, we already see the blessings that we are uh, having, the opportunities to bless others in our community. Lord, may we just um, appreciate this time as we come and give something back to you for all that you've done. Amen. So please sing and come. saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my my fears really how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are Oh, 
You may be seated. So while I introduce communion, get yourself prepared by opening the different layers that are in the, the cup. Today is, you know, we continue to look as Jonah, which will be later. And we know that Jonah wasn't exactly happy with what God wanted him to do and as I looked at what I was going to do for communion today I just wanted to bring scripture to mind that is not often read in modern churches anymore <clears throat> so this scripture <clears throat> is there and it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse sorry I got to take my glasses off verse 27 down through to 29 and that's at the end of the usual communion reading about, you know, this was given to me, that the Lord said, this is my, this body was broken bread, all the rest of it. And then at the end of that, which is still a part of this scripture, it reads, therefore whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognising the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. So how often in our normal monthly communion you automatically open your heart to God and allow him to search it to make sure there's nothing within you that's causing him grief. And we need to do that regularly. And I, talked, I think I talked about last week that we need to every day open our heart to God, allow him to come and guide us through the day and make sure that we're heading in the right direction, listening to his voice. But it's the same when we come to communion. This is a ritual, this is something Jesus asked us to do so that we would be a continual remembrance of the sacrifice he made, that God sent his one and only son to be that ultimate sacrificial lamb. And in honour or in respect of what Jesus did, the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to had these few verses after 
the sup, Lord's Supper part. Because as we take communion, we're confessing to each other that we truly believe who Jesus Christ is, that we have placed our whole heart, body, mind and soul into God's hands, that we have given up the ways of the world and we're following the ways of God. But like normal human beings, we do trip and fall and make mistakes. And communion is one of those times that we can allow ourselves to just truthfully come to God and go, yep, I know I tripped up this week or this month or something's happened and I know my thoughts went the wrong direction. Because as you take the cup and take the bread, you're not only witnessing to those around you, to those in the world, but you're also saying to God, I truly honour the sacrifice that Jesus has done. So I'm just going to give you a moment before we actually go into the communion ritual as such to allow your heart, your body, your mind, your soul to be truly open to God, to allow him to remind you of something that may have caused you to stumble, something you may not have asked, said, took, not, took to God. Or it might have been the way you spoke to someone or your attitude this week or whatever it was. But I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that now. So please just bow your heads and open your hearts to God. How great you are, O oh Lord. You broke our chains. You allowed us to become a part of your family. And as we come to do communion in the next few moments, Lord, I pray that our hearts, our minds, our bodies are truly set upon the course you have called us to, that we're truly focused upon you, that our hearts sings of the Lord, and that the ways of the world are just a fleeting image. And that there's a strong image of the cross and of your love and sacrifice for us in our minds and in our hearts. So we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to honour this sacrifice of the perfect lamb so that our sins could be washed away. In your name, amen. Take the bread. As you know, and we've done this many times, the bread represents the body of Jesus that was whipped and beaten and spat upon and beards ripped out and done all those things. He did that so you would never have to do that. So as you take the bread this morning, remember what Christ has done for you. And of course we have the cup which represents the blood of Jesus Christ and in that blood washed away all our sins so that we could come before God and say Father and he would look at us and say son or daughter. So as you take the cup, remember the blood that was poured out for you so that your blood would never have to be spilled to honour God. So as you go through the week, remember what Christ has done for you and honour him in all the things that he has called you to be. Chris, if you could come and bring the scripture reading.
Our reading today is from Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 to 10. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. This time, Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went to Nineveh, a city so large it took three days to see it all. On the day Jonah entered the city, he shouted to the crowds, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. The people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they declared a fast and put on burlap to show their sorrow. When the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne, took off his royal robes, he dressed himself in burlap and sat in a heap of ashes. Then the king and his nobles sent this decree to the city. Not one, not even the animals from your herds and flocks may eat or drink anything at all. People and animals alike must wear garments of mourning and everyone must pray earnestly to God. They must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence. Who can tell? Perhaps even yet God will change his mind and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. When God saw what they had done and how, he, so how they had put a stop to their evil ways, he changed his mind and did not carry out the, the destruction that he had threatened. This is the word of the Lord. We just come to a time of pastoral prayer now. Just excuse me if there's a few tears, just ignore it. There's a few family members that... Oh, there is a song first. <laughs> let's, um, let's sing and pop it up, please, for me. Thank you. Lord, I need you. How I need you. I need thee every hour. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you, for sin runs deep.
just then Oh God, how I need you Oh God, how I need you Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the way that you work in our life and at times, songs like that and an amazing grace remind us of how much we do need you. Father, we do. And we ask you this morning, will you touch each of the hearts in our congregation? Will you move through us, Lord? May we feel your presence and your comfort as we deal with life's issues. And Father, this morning, there are so many on my prayer list, so many people that we need to pray for that have got cancer, and are dealing with that issue. And I, Lord, this morning, I pray for my dear friend, Lynn, who is going in for her fifth operation tomorrow. And this is really serious, Father. And we just place her in your hands. I thank you that you know her and that you love her and that she has a great relationship with you and she walks in with confidence knowing that she is in the best hands. We pray for Bill, Lord, as he comforts her and walks alongside her. And Father, as the opportunity to spend time with her tonight comes, Lord, I pray that you will just place the right words and in, your, in my heart as I speak with her and spend time with her. Father, we pray for our dear sister Jenny here in our church group who's just away joined family time this weekend. But we pray for her, Lord, and for the needs that she has and this rash that just won't go away, Lord. And the medicines and the doctors, the things that they need to do to help her with that, Lord. We just pray that you will give her a peace, that, that the itch won't annoy her in her arms and her legs and back, Father. We just pray for a special blessing, a special touch upon her life. We rejoice um, with Kathy and Phil as Phil had his operation yesterday and, and is now recovering. We thank you, Lord, that he finally had that opportunity. We pray that you will be with him during recovery and just touch his body, Lord, we ask. And we thank you for their fellowship here at our church and we love them, Lord. May we continue to remember them in prayer this week as we go about our days. Heavenly Father, one of our pastors had an accident on the weekend and we, we want to lift him to you, David. And Father, we just pray that as he goes in goes through what the doctors are looking at now and having to help him deal with life differently father i pray that you will just bless him will you bless his church family will you have them draw close to him and surround him with your love this morning and over the next weeks and months ahead and may we as pastors continually uplift him he's a wonderful man of god and is so sold out for you so father be with those surgeons as they make decisions And, and Lord, we think of Alex too and Malalia as Alex now um, in his, his new place of residence. And Father, we just want to lift him to you, Lord. He um, moments doesn't like being there and wants to go home. And so, Father, we just want to pray for him. Would you comfort him? Would you help him to build friendships there and um, be with Malalia as she helps her dad too? And may we as a church just uphold him in prayer as well. Lord, as we go home this weekend, we're going to meet my uncles and all three of them now have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's and um, we specifically think of Aunty May and Aunty Rosabeth as they try and deal with these, um, this situation in their lives and have to look at care for them and, and help them through the, each of the days ahead. I thank you that they do know you that they have a relationship with you, Father, and, and we just want to place them in your hands at this time. Father, I think of my mum and I rejoice with the fact that she's still doing well and um, she turns 80 tomorrow. And Lord, I thank you that you've given us the opportunity to meet together as a family, to all enjoy a surprise party for her tomorrow, Lord. I pray that you will just give me the opportunity to love on the ones that don't know you and to really um, allow this to be a wonderful time for my mum to see her family because this may be the last time for some of it. And Lord, we remember John Fredericks who now lives down south, but we continue to lift him to you because he's dealing with the same issue of Alzheimer's. And, and Father, sometimes his memories aren't always there, but it's a, it's a great time talking to him because he still remembers our church. 
and he remembers those photos. And so, Father, we pray that you will keep some memories close to him and that he will know you love him and that, that um, you are with him as he walks these days. Thank you that he can be closer to family. So for each one here today, I'm sure there's all different ones dealing with all different issues in their lives, whether it's mobility, age, health, um, family that have got health problems or family that don't know you, Lord. We just want to place them all at the foot of your cross this morning and ask for your love and your comfort and your peace through each situation. Amen. You may be seated. So, Pastor David, what was the um, bloke who uh, month, um, was in May, I think it was, came and did the worship service and preached, so he played the guitar the Filipino guy. So he had a stroke while driving and then had a major accident after the stroke, well, because he was driving his car. I don't know where in Sydney that was happening, but he's from Mount Druid area. And so he's now um, <coughs> at Westmead Hospital uh, under a neurosurgeon uh, he has to meet with today. He became conscious again last night. And so if you can pray for him that um, God's hands will be upon the surgeons and all his carers and that, you know, the peace will be within his heart uh, so that um, no matter what happens, that he can get testified to God's love and grace in the, in the situation. So we continue on in our Jonah series. So we're looking at chapter 3 today as the scripture reading went through. So if you've got your Bible or have your app on your phone that you use, um, as you turn to chapter 3, um, so you can check out to make sure I'm reading the right scripture and that sort of thing. So as you do that, I just want to tell you that um, an introduction to this from my nursing career. So I worked as a nurse for a long time and a part of that time I spent in children's ward and um, you have children that come in with ear infections and strep. And of course, for as the air cooled at night time, their breathing would become more difficult, um, so they had trouble sleeping. And more often than not, they would have to get their tonsils and adenoids removed because that was the main reason behind the infection and the and breathing problems. And it's a very minor procedure, uh, even more so today uh, compared to back when I was doing nursing. And so you would have the toddler in after surgery and they would have to have that little thing on their finger called an oximeter so we could ensure that they were breathing deeply enough to get oxygen going through their body. And a, a lot of the times before we could put the IV in, we would have what we would nickname the goofy juice. And so this was just a sedative liquid that we would give the kids that would just calm them down so you could put an IV in so they could breathe more steadily. It also it would help a bit with the pain. Because I don't know if you've ever seen a TV show or had the experience of trying to put an IV in a toddler's arm or, or uh, someone at Hannah's age arm while they're sick and not feeling well. It's like going to the world of wrestling match um, with those kids. Because they understood that we were up to something they didn't want to happen. And so they would get just a little bit difficult to handle. And often enough, we would have to ask the parents to come in and tackle their child and pin them down, even after we've given them the juice sometimes, because the kids were that wide that they weren't too well and things were going to happen to them. And no matter how much we smiled and spoke, spoke calmly and gently at the child, you could tell that they were looking back at you going, no way. They would fight and they would struggle because this was scary. They couldn't really comprehend what was happening to them. 
not only in their body, but what we were about to do to them and the procedures that were happening. They could just hear the adults talking about words. And no matter how much they fought, we still would need to do these things for them. They just didn't understand that we needed to stay the course to keep doing this for their physical betterment. In the toddler's mind, I'm sure they would often question their parents' move about how much they cared and loved for them. But they did not realise that their mum or dad that was wrestling with them was doing so because they loved them and they needed to do this because it was necessary. So when looking to God, it's not, the question is not does God care, but it's more the desire he's, where his care comes from. God's care is not just seen when he rescues you from the storm, because the storm is his care. Because he is zealous. He wants you back in his family. He wants you back to him. He wants to rescue you. And sometimes to rescue someone, it seems violent. You have to go in and tackle the person and and hold them down to keep them safe and others safe. He rips you from what is dangerous to give you what is better. And sometimes it doesn't feel like that when he's doing it, in that moment. God will often, times, will bring us to the end of ourselves so that we will turn and face him. He does this ultimately to bring us back to him and so that we are in his purpose, in his plan for our lives. And this is a lesson Jonah was in the process of learning and one that we are looking at today. So let's look at what's happened so far. God has told Jonah, who's a prophet, to go to Nineveh, tell them they need to give up their wicked ways. And Jonah's gone, (laughs) no, and went the opposite direction. He just got up and ran, grabbed a ticket, got on a ship, storm came, sailors were frightened. Jonah said, it's me. They chucked him overboard, storm calmed, sailors were saved, believed in who God was. Now Jonah is out of the storm and the fish has been swimming along for three days and three nights. And God said to him, vomit or spit him out where I told you. And he's done that. So Jonah's out of the fish. But he's not yet out of God's school of learning. In Jonah chapter 3, 1 to 2, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time, Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message I have given you. And those words don't seem like much. But when you compare them to what's happened before this in the first two chapters, where Jonah is absolutely and defiant and rebellious and rejection of God and his purpose and plan for him, these words are unmerited, undeserved favour of God's grace, a second chance. And normally no one likes to hear that word second because in our normal everyday life and in the world that we live in, second is nothing more than just holding the title of the first place loser. No one ever sets out to be the runner-up in anything. If you talk to Olympians or sports, elite sports people, they don't say to you things like, yeah, you know, I train 60 hours a week, you know, I lift those weights, I go to the gym, I listen to my coach, I stick to the diet. You know, they don't say that just to say, so I can come second. 
Second is simply not a word that any of us really want to use or hear in our lives. The only way you really want to hear that word used in a sentence is, I'm giving you a second chance. For those of us who've blown it at some point in time, that word second becomes a tremendous word of grace. You've blown it with your girlfriend because you missed the third week anniversary of the first time you saw her wearing her pretty blue summer dress. God will give you a second chance. You have blown it with your wife because you remembered the first day of the footy season but forgot her birthday. God will give you a chance. You have blown it with your children. God will give you a second chance. You have blown it with your boss. You have have just done. Well, God will give you a second chance. You have tripped and stumbled and fallen out of the plan and purpose God has given you, he will give you a second chance. Those words the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time are sweet words, are precious words. They are priceless words. There's an old saying that goes something like this. Everyone deserves a second chance. It sounds good, but it's not true. We don't deserve a second chance. We get a first chance and we blow it, waste it or walk away from it, and then we get is justice. Second chance is nothing short of grace. And that's what Jonah was showing, uh, that's what God was showing Jonah giving him a second chance. God hadn't changed. Jonah had. God's plan hadn't changed. God's design and desire for Jonah's life had not changed. God brought Jonah to the end of himself and it was in the bellies of a great fish. so that Jonah could turn and face God, so that God could issue that call again, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh, deliver that message I have given you. I want you to understand that the purpose of the storm is not to change our circumstances and definitely not to change God, but it's to change us ourselves. Though the lesson is not fully learned, we find that something is changing in Jonah. God's not just going to do work in Nineveh, but God is also doing work in Jonah. If you haven't noticed, the first part of chapter 3 and chapter 1 are very eerily similar. There are very few differences, but the differences that are there are huge. They make all the difference in the world. So if you look at chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, we see God telling Jonah to go to Nineveh. And in verse 3, it tells us exactly what Jonah did. Jonah got up and went in totally the opposite direction. He went to the port of Joppa and then took a ship to Tarshish. But when you look at chapter 3, verses 1 to 3a, It's totally different. God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh. And what happens in verse 3? Jonah obeyed the Lord's command and went. The big difference is the very first words in verse 3. In in chapter 1, God's word came and the first word describing Jonah's action is but. And that's not a good word. When but's used in a sentence, things aren't necessarily going right. 
I was going to do this for you, but I don't have time. I was going to the beach, but a cyclone hit. I was going to give you a job, but your references do not check out. You get the picture about that word, but. Now in verse 3, chapter 3, after God's word came a second time, we find a different word used altogether. So. And so, and that word so usually has something much better following it. You come home and say, you know, I was thinking we should go out to a nice restaurant tonight for supper. So, get dressed and let's go. It's such a nice ring to it, but better than being that big but. So, is so much more gentle, so much more forward moving. But puts a stop in the sentence, in your life, whereas so brings a movement forward and gentleness to it. God calls us to obedience in, in areas of our spiritual life so that we can walk in a way that is worthy of him. Instead of saying, okay, we say, Lord, that sounds really neat, but I know that you're calling me, calling to give me my, uh, my life to you and to be saved, but I know you are calling me to make my faith public and to be baptised, immersed in water, but I know you are calling me to be faithful and giving a tithe to you, but... And Jonah is learning a lesson that we all need to learn. And that is the obedience brings blessing and disobedience invites burden and correction. When God speaks, we should have one response. Yes, Lord. Because Jonah obeyed God, he had the privilege of seeing God do such an unbelievable spiritual miracle in the most unlikely of cities in the most unwilling of hearts, in the most ungodly of people, in that dreaded town of Nineveh. At the heart of this book about Jonah, we find God's heart, a heart for missions, a heart for evangelism, a heart to see people repent of their sin and come to faith in Christ. Jonah was unwilling to sound the alarm and extend a warning to these ungodly people. He knew that the warning was this offer of grace. He knew that a warning of judgment to come was also an opportunity to repent. Jonah was not concerned about those outside of his own nation. He was not concerned about those who were on the outside of God's covenant with his people. He was not concerned about those who did not know God or were away from God. But Jonah once again was face to face with God. And as he looks into God's face, he sees something that is repeated in so many ways throughout the whole of Scripture. And that is love and concern for all people and a desire to see them come to faith. Jonah may not have been concerned about the spiritual condition and salvation of this nation, but God was. And God is still concerned about the spiritual condition and salvation of people. No matter what nation they live in, no matter where they are on this earth, God is concerned. Some of us may not give it a second thought. Some of us may not even be concerned outside of our own little community, but God is. Are there Ninevites alive today? The answer is yes. Some of them could be in this room. Some of them are in your neighbourhood. Some of them are at your work 
Some of them may even be your children, your partner, your friends, your parents, your family members. There are people who are far from God. And no one, and I mean absolutely no one, is too far gone. There is no one so low that God cannot reach down to them. There is no one so cemented in sin that God cannot pull them out of it. There is no one too damaged that God can make, not make, can make them new. There is no heart that is too hard that God cannot break through. There is no one so fast that they can outrun the hound of heaven that pursues their soul. They need to hear. They need to be told. They need people who are willing to speak. They need people who are willing to go. We need people who are willing to step out of their comfort zones and cross cultural, racial, national, social, economical, economic barriers or lines or fences and in even geographical ones to bring these people the gospel. Our call is the same as Jonah. Preach the gospel. Call the people to repentance. Call people to God. Like Jonah, we have been called to the nations. We have been called to take the gospel across the street and around the world. In the remaining verses in 3 to 10, Jonah obeys God and spends three days delivering his message to these ungodly people. A message of repentance. So what happened? These people believed the words that Jonah was saying. They fasted and prayed, so God listened and decided not to destroy them. And this is just a miraculous event. Absolutely amazing. It is... It is, as some would say, a God thing. Think about it. You have a reluctant and somewhat unwilling prophet going into the most wicked and vile city of his day with a very simple but poignant message. Repent. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown are the words he said. It's not politically correct. It is one of the most messages that offends the sensitivities of normal people. A call to recognise what they are doing, the way that they are living, the direction they are heading is wrong. And they will end up in absolute destruction. Just tell someone they need to give their life to God or they will spend eternity in hell is not a message to stir the hearts to faith, but it fans the flame of anger. Has that happened to you? It's happened to me a few times where it's so obviously clear they just need to give up their life that they lead and give it to God. So you talk to them gently about who God is and then he calls them to give up their life, to repent and to listen to God. And instead of seeing an uh, expression of just freedom come on the face, you get this face that starts to get angry the face goes red they start to boil the world has to hear the bad news before it is ever ready for the good 
Someone has to stand and say, I am not okay. You are not okay. And everything is not going to be okay. We need to turn from our ways. We need to take our self and turn to God, fall on his mercy and grace and allow his grace to work in us, to allow salvation to become a part of our life. It was the message of prophets, John the Baptist, Jesus himself. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. I don't know how enthusiastically Jonah gave this message. He was only supposed to say what God told him, but we have no idea how passionately he preached or proclaimed it. Just a simple message and miracles happen. A city-wide revival started and revival always starts with people confessing, repenting and humbling themselves before God. This happened from the palace to the pool hall. Even the animals were dressed to show the repentant hearts and prayers for mercy. Did you notice that once Jonah delivered the message, was faithful, was obedient, the focus of the story shifts to what God does and to the people who were listening to Jonah. The same is true for us. As we are called to obedience and called to go, we are called to share. And once we have done that, everything rests on God. It's not our place to continue. God, in truth, has already been working and preparing the hearts of the people through their struggles and disasters. And when we look at this particular town, there was military struggles and a solar eclipse. Just look up 2 Kings 14.25. God had already been preparing the Ninevites' hearts They needed someone to speak of the word of God to them. Once again, it's amazing as we look at this story how gracious God is, the God of second chance. And when God saw what they did and how they turned their face away from their lies, from their evil ways, God was gracious and merciful. And he said he would not destroy them. And he didn't do it. God doesn't rejoice in the destruction of the wicked. He is glorified in all he does, but he does not rejoice when people perish. God is patient towards us, not desiring any to perish, but all to come to faith in him. I want you to see something in this passage today, in this chapter of Jonah. God's great love for people, for those who belong to him and those who are disobedient, those who are are running, who have blown it, who have thrown their testimony away, have traded the glory of God for the gaudiness and the emptiness of the world. And for those who don't know God, he is the God of second chance. He's the God of grace. Yes, he is the God of second chance, third, fourth, fifth and fiftieth. But he is not the God of infinite chances. His spirit will not always strive with a man or a woman and the opportunity, the window for repentance is open but it will not always be open forever. You tell God, No, long enough. You will not hear his voice any longer. So if you've strayed, walked away, if you're listening online and you don't know who God is but you've been listening to this message, why don't you come to him in repentance and faith? Whether you're a Christian or a lost person, whether you've been running away from what God has called you to. 
listen to God. Look at what Jonah did. Learn from his mistakes. And come and bring your heart to God and go, yes, Lord, I'm yours. And if you've known God but have stepped away and you don't know where you're supposed to be or what you're supposed to be doing, come back to him. Turn to him. Look him in the face so you can see his purpose and plan for you. Let's pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you. We thank you that you call us to obedience. You call us to go. You call us to share. And once we've done that, our job's done. Everything else is in your hands. You're the only one who can accept that person, wash away their sins. We can't do that. And so, Lord, I pray that we do listen for your purpose and plan in our lives. Whether it's being called to ministry, whether it's called to a specific job, whether it's a call to testify to our families and friends and workmates, or just to be there for someone where no words are spoken, but your love is shown through the grace and mercy and actions we do for that person. So, Lord, as we go and live our lives, may we always turn and face you. May we always be walking in your shadow, in your grace, your mercy, your love. And may we remember that as we look at your word, as we hold the Bible up to people, that this is words of love. And that love is seen throughout Scripture as you've tried many times in the Old Testament to bring them back to you and then giving him all those chances, all those prophets to the point where you knew it was time to give your son as the ultimate sacrifice, as a way to bridge that gap between you and us and in giving his life his body, his blood, and dying on that cross and being buried in that tomb and rising again, it changed history for all mankind because in his death, our death happens too. In his resurrection, our resurrection happens too. So all we need to do is just go, Jesus and open ourselves to him and allow him into our lives. May we share your love in all that we do. And if we can't, don't know the words to say, may we have the actions to show it, the emotions to give, and the grace to be given so that people can see your love for things. Thank you, Lord. In your glorious and wonderful name. Amen. Please stand with me as we sing in closing a older song that you guys should all know called Yes, Lord, Yes. Because that's what we need to do. Is we need to come to Jesus and just stand before God and just say yes, Lord, yes. No matter what he's saying, what direction he's pointing. They're the words we should be saying.
And so, as you say, yes, Lord, yes, this week. May your week be blessed by those moments of quietness. Light in your darkness, strength in your weakness, grace in your meekness, joy in your gladness, peace in your stillness. May your week be blessed and you a blessing to others. We'll see you all at morning tea and have a great week as you say yes to the Lord in all that he calls you to be. Thank you.